So our next speaker is Dr Kim Tolbeer, and it's also a delight to host her here at this conference today. So my vision for this conference was always to ensure that we put Indigenous people's management of resources front and centre in, or in recognition of partnership with Māori at every level of the ch Science Challenge. So Kim is visiting from overseas. She is an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. She's also on the Canada, uh, the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples. And she's going to speak today about decolonising science and technology. Welcome, Kim. Good morning. Um, you know, I, I never actually asked how I ended up getting invited. I feel <laughs> a little humbled to be speaking on Indigenous issues uh, so far from home. Um, and I also neglected to ask friends here, Maori friends here, about uh, territorial, ter territorial acknowledgments. So I, I should have asked about that. So I just uh, um, I wanted to acknowledge the, the traditional lands of the people that we're on. Um, and uh, I can't say anything more specific than that, but uh, I've always been very, very welcomed when I come to, excuse me, my Maori is terrible, Aotearoa, is that, is that good enough? <laughs> I don't want to speak with such a gringo accent, but that is what it is. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of background before I give this talk, which is largely pragmatic, but it's going to end um, by talking about a narrative turn that I think we need to take globally. So I'll get into some humanities stuff at the end. Uh, I was trained in my first career as an environmental and a community planner and policy specialist, uh, and so I worked for uh, U.S. tribes, federal agencies, uh, national tribal organizations, and uh, in private consulting for about 15 years doing environmental policy and planning. Um, but then I was working on a project for the Department of Energy back when they were still funding human genome research and doing tribal engagement at that time in the cleanup of the nuclear weapons complex, which we know is a joke. That's not going to get cleaned up. Um, they started funding human genome research and wanting to do tribal engagement in the mapping of the human genome, and I got fascinated with that. And I thought, well, I'm not qualified to sit at the table and participate in these conversations in a knowing way. There was a lot of conversation about blood and race and. Uh, those kinds of ideas happening around the mapping of the human genome, especially in indigenous communities. People were very worried at that time about what that kind of research would mean for our communities. And so I went back and did a PhD and, uh, and ended up writing a book called uh, Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science, which was basically I became an anthropologist of scientists, so scientists are my research subjects. So when I'm, at a, at a, when I'm at a meeting like this, this is my field site, and I'm always observing your curious cultural practices. So I wrote that book, and I ended up uh, studying human population geneticists, and I also studied family tree researchers or genealogists who use uh, genetic ancestry tracing to fill in the gaps in their family trees. Um, a lot of that was online ethnography, but I couldn't keep the planner, the former planner, out of my work. And so here I am as a social scientist who studies scientists, but I also am very interested um, in helping build programs still. And so I was studying scientists, and I started to meet a lot of younger critical scientists, and I got really invested not only in studying them, but in helping them build their careers, particularly indigenous scientists. And so a lot of the work that I do now is still very social science and humanities oriented, but it's also really invested in changing science from within because I'm pretty critical and I'm pretty pretty invested, but nobody's gonna, no scientist is gonna listen to Kim Tallbear <laughs> about how to change those fields. I really do think we need um, indigenous people and other diverse people, and I'll talk about that on the inside, helping change these fields from within. So. Figure out how to work this thing. Okay. So I'm going to talk about four roles uh, that Indigenous people have occupied in uh, in scientific research historically, and this is kind of big. Uh, this is a big macro level uh, talk until we get to the end. So research object. People might say subject, but it's really been object. So it's commonly thought that racial science ended a long time ago. We hear it mischaracterized as pseudoscience, but distinguished scientists practiced then cutting edge science. Nazi Germany took foundational lessons from the US and Britain, and here you see in a textbook the hierarchy of man, 
with the Greek skull at the pinnacle viewed as less evolved than Negros, it's just above the ape. With the Greek, um, viewed as, other 19th century illustrations, uh, there's, it's not here, but you can uh, see other textbooks that show the quote unquote American Indian just below the Greek and above the Negro. So that was the theory of cultural evolution. And so the view that uh, indigenous people, well, the, the word then was American Indian, had uh, evolved from a state of savagery into a middle stage of uh, barbarism. And then you have, of course, the civilized European at the top. Um, you fast forward to 1939 in the next picture and you have a German scientist measuring a Tibetan woman's cranium. He, he ended up advising, I think that's 19, yeah, 1939, that same man ended up advising not, Nazi doctors on race science in the camps. So you have a real learning taking a physical anthropology and in the 19th century the school of American anthropology was bone science, it was physical anthropology. The picture below that um, is from the mid 20th century. There were nutrition experiments conducted on First Nations people in Manitoba and in six residential schools across Canada. Indigenous people, some of them almost starved, were used as a living laboratory for nutrition scientists to pursue research questions about which they were curious. And I'll, I'll give you those questions. Uh, I have quotes. Number one, was the shiftless, indolent, inert Indian really simply a malnourished subject? Number two, were food supplied by traders, and keep in mind after indigenous people were removed from their land and had the availability of, of food, right, and their ways of life cut from beneath their feet, were foods then supplied by traders inadequate in light of modern nutritional knowledge? So these were the quotes that these scientists thought worthy of investigating, and they used starving elders and children, very malnourished elders and children, in order to pursue those questions. This is the 1950s in Canada. Okay, the next question uh, is looking at 21st century colonial science. This is start, starting in the 1990s, going into the uh, early 21st century. I never know when I leave the U.S. how many of people have heard of the Havasupai case, but I'll give you a little uh, um, overview just in case. So the Havasupai are a tribe at the base of the Grand Canyon, and if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you know that you can hike down into it in a few hours, but you better not plan on hiking back out in a few hours. <laughs> People have died trying to do that. You can also take donkeys down in there. You can helicopter in and out. Um, so they are more than a lot of indigenous communities you could consider them remote in that way just because it's so hard to get in and out of there. So there was a principal investigator, Therese Markow, who was at Arizona State University back in the early 1990s who had mostly worked with Drosophila or fruit flies. So the ethics there are much less problematic than working with humans, as you know if you do human subjects research. She teamed up with a cultural anthropologist um, because he had a genealogy on the Havasupai and had a long-standing relationship working with them. And they went down into the Grand Canyon and she wanted to do uh, diabetes research. Now, if you know anything about indigenous communities participating in genetics research, they are more often amenable to participating in research that they think is going to have some uh, long-term cure for them or for other indigenous people. And so they were interested in doing that. Um, but Therese Markow also wanted to do schizophrenia research. They were not interested. It's stigmatizing in and of itself, and it's also doubly stigmatizing because you study consanguinity or inbreeding as you're studying schizophrenia, so they said no. That's, that's what the, uh, the investigative report came to show. Um, a few years later, the diabetes research had, had proceeded apace, and there was a dissertation defense happening at Arizona State University one day, and the, the Havasupai woman there at the foreground of that picture um, Carletta Toulouse was actually doing a master's degree in uh, justice studies at Arizona State and she saw a little flyer on campus that said this dissertation defense was happening and it was about Havasupai. She went to the dissertation defense and here she finds out that there had been a grant written to apply for money to do schizophrenia research. All hell broke loose during that dissertation defense. I don't know if the guy got his dissertation graduated or not. Um, and this, is, this launched a, a, a big 300-page independent investigative report. The Havasupai sued Arizona State University or the Arizona Board of Regents for quite a bit of money. I guess they settled out of court for about $700,000, but it was much less than they had sued for. Um, so there were a few things that went wrong in that case. And, uh, it, uh, these things go wrong in smaller ways in, in multiple research projects, but this all kind of came to a head and it serves as a good case study because of that. Not only did they do research that the tribe says they explicitly forbade, 
um, and there, there was a problem with the informed consent forms. Um, there, then there, it deteriorated into arguments and disagreements between the PI and her students as to what happened to those consent forms, was consent taken or not. But the other thing that happened was those samples, uh, those human biological samples got traded around from lab to lab. And this is something that was really common until the Havasupai court case. So I was in a lab back in 2003 uh, taking a Native American molecular anthropology class from a scientist, and I ended up meeting one of his graduate students who's now one of my main collaborators, very, very critical scientist. Um, a phone call came in that day saying, we need some Southeast US samples or seminal samples. Have you got any? Sure, I'll send them over to you. This is not OK anymore. <laughs> um, but this was OK back then. So the idea that the scientist owns the, the property right in those samples, and indigenous people have really pushed back after that case, but they were already before. So just an idea that while these older forms of what we might view as colonial science or race science are much easier to spot from our vantage point now, we still have these long-standing hierarchies between the way scientists view their knowledge production and the way they view indigenous bodies and indigenous resources, whether that's land, water, minerals, or the biologicals in our body, as being part of the kinds of property they can claim in the service of developing the nation state. So I'll come back to that more at the end. So that's the object part. Okay. Now let's talk about indigenous people as collaborators. So it doesn't have to be the way that it's, that it's gone in, the, in those cases that I show. So these are some pictures from a collaboration that happened, I think, from about 2010 to 2013 between the University of California, Berkeley, and the Pinoleville Pomo Nation, which is a very small tribe in Mendocino County, California. So there were several things that happened in this uh, collaborative project. You see uh, graduate and undergraduate students in the, uh, pick the photo on the right. And, and these are students of uh, an, an, an engineering professor at Berkeley, uh, Alice Agagino. And uh, Dr. Agagino is a self-declared de uh, feminist engineer. And if anybody has a question about that later, we can talk about why that matters. Feminism isn't, isn't only about women. It's about uh, attacking these kinds of hierarchies and knowledge production. So what Alice Agagino did was got this group of students together and designed basically what I, as a former planner, would call this kind of community-based planning project that accomplished both education and uh, produced a product for the community. So you see in the foreground there the final housing design they came up with. So Berkeley engineering students and faculty and architecture students and faculty worked with student, uh, worked also with people who d do biomimicry. So they, they engage with the tribe for a few years and, and they involve the community youth, um, adults, elders, and uh, planners and staff who worked for the tribe as well. So the tribe, this is what was so interesting about the Pinoleville Pomo, they didn't only consider the community the people that were members of their tribe, they actually included all their staff members as well in those community conversations because they had non-indigenous people and people from other tribes working on that project. So they got together and they talked about the sort of core values um, that the, the tribal, the community members had around building uh, green housing. So they learned a few things in this. They learned that both indigenous people and scientists bring cultural ideas, not only technical ideas, to define sustainability. So the Berkeley crowd, you know, coming from Berkeley in the Bay Area, brought secular and human-centric ideas to their notions of sustainability. The Pomo also tended to have uh, bigger families, and they're more rural. So that was really interesting. You had. Um, a very well-known architecture professor who came up and had in mind this what we normally think about green housing in an, in an urban area. Well, this isn't going to work for Pomo that have big families. They tend to congregate in the kitchens. They needed space for their regalia for dancing. They needed space for the supplies that they gather to, to weave and to build canoes. And so they needed a, a, a space allocation that was really different in that house, and they, and they wanted bigger spaces. They also wanted east-facing windows in the houses because they say morning prayers. And, oh, and they also um, tried to find ways within the house, even though it looks pretty square, there's many more rounded corners inside, which increases the cost of building um, to do that. But spirits hide in square corners, so they wanted round corners. So they ended up having these kinds of trade-offs that were about space, uh, that were about um, cultural values and ways of living that caused them to have to engage in conversations with engineers about how you keep a house green and sustainable, but you kind of alter the, the building structure. And so they learned a lot about the urban academics cultural values about how one lives and how they should live and how this then dictates and shapes the kinds of spaces that we live in. 
Um, they also learned that they each bring technical know-how, for example, related to building materials, and so they ended up trying to use a lot of uh, more traditional building materials traditional from a POMO point of view, not traditional from an urban kind of Westerner's point of view in the construction of those houses. So the, what also happened, the, the tribe gets a housing design out of this and, and several houses for their community. I'm not sure what's happened since then. I need to check back in. But the students earn degrees. They publish papers with faculty. Um, they, they ended up uh, also having a big influence over some of the youth in the community. So you see the, the um, young boy there. I th um, he's the son of uh, the, the guy down at the bottom of the straw bale. And one of the things that they re the children started saying, oh, you mean I could go to Berkeley and be an engineer? So Mendocino County is only two hours north of Berkeley, but this is a world apart. You have, uh, as with a lot of indigenous communities in the US, you know, people are rural and they're poor. Um, and so there, it was a really important for these children to see diverse engineers. The, the young African-American man in the Berkeley t-shirt, that's uh, Ryan Shelby, who got his PhD with Dr. Uh, Agagino um, in, uh, I think, civil engineering. And uh, so Ryan really made good friends with some of the kids there. He comes from a uh, rural Alabama, Alabama family, African-American family, who were ranchers and uh, historically were sharecroppers. And so he came from a rural, poorer community. And this mattered for these, for these young people to see somebody doing engineering at Berkeley that they could relate to more. So it was partly through this project and other projects I've worked on that I began to see that it's not, I'm not being Pollyanna by saying that diversity can change science. I think it actually can help change science. So now I want to talk about the role of indigenous peoples as scientists. And so when I began to think more about the, the way that I think actually having diverse scientists and engineers can make a difference, it's also, I realize, kind of a chicken and egg problem, right? And that having more diversity in science generates more diversity. So I've learned that diverse identities and bring diverse values and experiences. Um, but I also have a word of caution and then I'll talk about some of these stories. Whatever one's personal identification, so one can be indigenous or African American, come from a first generation university, be a first generation university student. Training as a scientist, big S, involves indoctrination into the privileges conferred by that symbolic white lab coat. So for centuries, scientific institutions have considered diverse bodies and cultures deviant. Western-defined truth has been seen as existing in opposition to non-Western backwardness. And I'll come back to this again. For me, the fundamental binary that has caused a lot of these problems is that notion of savage or backwards or unenlightened versus civilized, rational, forward thinking. This is a binary that continues to predominate in scientific conversations, um, even while we seek to move beyond the more explicit cases of racism, sexism, and, and, and other forms of chauvinism that have plagued older scientific practices that we now recognize as, as explicitly colonial. So I've learned throughout uh, these projects that I've worked on that there are two ways to diminish colonialism in science, and the first involves collaborative research, which we saw on that last slide, and then the second is to train diverse scientists in a way that takes a decolonial approach. So I have learned by working with young indigenous geneticists and genetic archaeologists that indigenous scientists who have regular conversations quite often with cultural advisors back home might ask different questions, and they might invent, for example, culturally sensitive lab protocols. So these possibilities are highlighted in the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics, or SING, which was founded, I think our first year was 2010, at the Institute for Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois. We have uh, scientists, social scientists, bioethicists, uh, acting as faculty members from multiple universities. We've got people at the University of Arizona. I'm involved now from the University of Alberta. Um, we've got a Singh uh, Aotearoa that just uh, started this last January, and that's headed up by uh, Maui Hudson and a group of other faculty members at uh, University of Waikato. So I, I hear that was really successful, and they're going to do a new uh, summer internship. I don't know if it happens in summer here. January, that's summer, right? OK. <laughs> so it happens in summer here, too. Um, um, how much time do I have? Plenty of time. Okay. 
so that's the, that, that bottom left picture is from that. Uh, the picture on the right is really interesting. Those two women are both members of the Colville tribe, which is in Washington state, and they are both genetic archeologists. And it's uh, the one on the left, Jill Black, uh, the one with the gray hair, she actually is a master's student, and this isn't rocket science. She developed a technique to look at DNA from the calcified plaque from the teeth of remains in order not to destroy bone. And so, the, the Kennewick Man case, if anyone's heard about that, they were 9,600-year-old remains unearthed in the Columbia River in 1996. Huge, big fight between eight uh, anthropologists and geneticists and the five tribes in that area that claim an affiliation, a historical affiliation with that area, and were claiming an affiliation with what scientists called Kennewick Man and what they called the Ancient One. The Colville tribe was one of those tribes, so most of the indigenous people in the area back in 96 when those remains were found, and they, they didn't have the genetic analyses available at that point to get DNA out of those remains. They were not so well preserved, as, as far as I remember. So. They weren't able to do it at the time, but there was all this litigation happening since that time. Well, um, fast forward to about 2010 or 11, and uh, Jill and Tracy Pierre, the uh, woman on the right, were advocating with Colville that they actually go in and do some genetic analysis because they said, we as Colville tribal members who have genetic um, training will also bring a different kind of set of values to dealing with these quote unquote remains. And they, you know, they view them at, they don't fall under human subjects research, but for us, these are human. <laughs> they are just because they're remains doesn't mean they're not human, and that you don't have to, and there, there's a, English is really inadequate for this, and I don't like the term life force necessarily, but there, there's, there's a, a way in which one interacts with the material remains of your dead that is not, you don't treat them like some inanimate object. And they said, because we don't treat them like that, we think that we should, f we, we have more incentive to figure out ways to work with these remains in less invasive ways. Now, the Colville actually ended up this last year, um, last couple of years, providing DNA from living tribal members as well um, to, uh, in, in a research project that was trying to actually demonstrate di direct descent of uh, existing indigenous people to those remains, but they were the only tribe in the area that would actually uh, give DNA, that would give blood and participate in that research project. Um, and, and the remains were shown to be a, a ancestral to the people there, which of course the, was not a surprise in Indian country, but apparently it was a surprise to some of the scientists. Uh, when the remains were first found, you may have seen the, the scientist who first looked at them at first thought they were a European settler, and then when he realized the antiquity of the bones, released a picture that was comparing the skull of Kennewick Man to that Star Trek actor, Patrick Stewart, so everybody in the US was like, oh, see, white people were here first. And this there was kind of this racist sort of stuff happening around that. So this is why, in part why this became such a controversial case. Okay. But throughout all of this, I think it, it, I showed you these pictures just to focus on the fact that we are training scientists and I think it will make a difference. And then the picture on the upper left, I'm not sure how well you can see that. That's from a session we did at the American Association of Physical Anthropology. Um, well, it was the, when the science and the March for Science was happening on April 22nd, so I guess that was a couple of weeks ago in New Orleans. We had this invited podium session, and I can't even read it because it's too far away, but basically it was uh, 12 talks of, of diverse scientists. Um, so we had people uh, talking about how their, their queer and bisexual identity changed the way that they approached their ancient DNA work. These talks were fascinating, and, they were, and it was interesting to see these young diverse, so we had indigenous scientists, we had African American scientists, we had uh, a primatologist at Arizona State University who grew up in poverty and talked about the way that growing up in poverty shaped her difficult cultural path through academia. Uh, we had a, a lot of queer scientists there, and, and people were being very explicit about the way that where they are situated, how, and they were uncomfortable, right, because these are people trained as scientists, too. But they, they made themselves write these talks where they actually looked back and said, how did, how, how am, where I am situated as a non-dominant person, as as a diverse person, how has this shaped the kinds of questions that I've asked? And they really had to sit back and look at that. The lesson being that everybody does that. It's just that we're taught not, and we're taught in the way that we're trained scientifically not to acknowledge that as part of the broader story about how we come to ask the questions we ask, how we come to develop the methods and the ethics that we use in the course of research. So that's the third role. The fourth role that I look at in looking at indigenous engagements with science and technology is uh, governance. And so that picture on the left is the Amamutsan Band. 
in Central Coast, California. I had a graduate student, I used to be at the University of California, Berkeley, it's how I know about that, that other project in the uh, College of Natural Resources. I was one of a small group of social scientists and humanities people um, within the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department. So one of my grad students who's now graduated um, is a member of the, uh, the Amamutsen Band. They're also known as Ohlone, and they're in Central Coast California. There are also a lot of their people in the Bay Area. They, uh, this is their traditional homeland. They don't have any jurisdiction over it because they're not a federally recognized tribe, but one of the things that they've done in the absence of that regulatory authority is they've actually partnered with the Department of Environmental Quality in California, and they've gotten together with local non-indigenous landowners to look back historically at indigenous techniques of fire management in that area. Area. And because settlers came in and built houses where they shouldn't have, tried to stop naturally occurring wildfires, you've got this really messed up kind of wildfire situation in California. So you've got local non-indigenous people, indigenous people, and environmental scientists now coming together to look at how to uh, manage those landscapes in ways that are both drawing on contemporary forms of science, but also drawing on a quote unquote traditional ecological knowledge. And so, one of the other things that, that they've learned about the way indigenous peoples interacted with those landscapes, of course, is that they were managed. They weren't, they weren't just completely hands off. And they managed those landscapes in a way that it not only curbed those really um, uh, damaging, uh, out of control wildfires, but they also managed them in a way where the land produced resources that they needed. So, th so certain kinds of fire would produce um, grasses that they needed in, in, in a certain state that they could use to, to weave and to make their canoes. And so they, they learned to produce a, a landscape that produced things that they really needed. And so it, this has been a really interesting uh, kind of collaboration. I also want to say too that when I, 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 I often use quotes around the term traditional ecological knowledge because I actually think that indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge is any knowledge that we can use to survive as indigenous collectives, as indigenous people. And I say that because I move a lot between these sort of traditional ecological knowledge communities and these quote unquote Western science communities. And I see indigenous communities using multiple forms of knowledge and knowledge production to ensure the, the vibrancy of their collectivity. And so I don't tend to make a distinction necessarily between what is science and what is traditional knowledge. Um, the other, uh, the national, the other picture on the top right is the na as, uh, an image from the National Center for Indigenous Genomics, and this is uh, a an organization in Australia that is bringing indigenous community members and researchers into a national conversation about how to do genomics differently with indigenous priorities centered. And one of the things that they're doing is thinking about how to rehabilitate these old biological samples that were taken under ethical protocols that we no longer find acceptable, and figure out how to use those. Um, to do ongoing research because people are not comfortable with the way those samples were taken, including scientists, and they don't want to do further research on them without figuring out with communities how they do that and how communities might want to um, help govern um, those samples. And then the picture on the right is, that's an old picture of me when I was much younger. It was from a, a tribal, national tribal enrollment conference back in 2003. There was a uh, DNA testing company. There are a lot of tribes in the U.S. and First Nations in Canada now use um, parentage testing, genetic parentage testing, to help do enrollment uh, in their communities. And I sort of show that as not a great example of tribes using uh, science and technology to govern. One of the things that happens, and this is still the case all these years later, um, tribes in the U.S. and Canada don't have adequate science advising. Um, we, have a lot, we have many more attorneys and teachers. People go into those fields to, to give back at home, but we don't have enough people doing science and genetics to advise us on how to actually use genetics and enrollment and what the pitfalls of that might be. So you have the very same companies that are profiting from selling tests to tribes also advising them on how to use them. And geneticists never understand, almost never do they understand the complex colonial politics and the way that indigenous peoples have been relocated. The places in which we have intersected and moved around, how we have inter intermarried between different communities. They tend to have these, these 
very historically uninformed ideas about uh, indigenous people as these static populations in place. Well, of course, that in and itself is an implicit denial of colonialism, because if we were still in place, settlement wouldn't have happened in the way that it's happened. So they're very, they, they need a lot more historical training. On the other hand, you've got indigenous leadership um, who don't know the genetics. And so this is another reason I'm advocating for, for us training more people in science and technology, because you need an understanding of the very complex politics of indigenous relocation enrollment and membership, the way that we do family, the way that we do belonging, and you need an understanding of the complexity of genomics. And if I can say, the basics of genetic parentage testing and genetic ancestry testing are less complicated than the basics of tribal membership. So. Um, there's a group of young uh, indigenous geneticists in the U.S. that have started a new, uh, not, I think it's a, I don't know if it's a consulting firm or a nonprofit called Indigenomics, and they, they're working to advise indigenous communities on just these kinds of things. So, <clears throat> now, we live in a world governed by science despite people's worries that that is under assault. And because that is the case, I want, now want to spend, do I have 10 more minutes? Okay. I now want to talk about um, the need to construct another kind of narrative to help us make sense of the world that we live in and the world in which we do science and produce technology. Because I'm also a humanities scholar, so we're going to talk about narrative. So, and that's the notion that we are all related, and this comes out in different kinds of words and forms in uh, non-indigenous communities. So. I want to take the, uh, the, the next little bit of time to talk about the colonial grounds from which science and technology fields, like all disciplines in the academy, continue to grow despite um, these openings for more decolonial science and technology. And I want to talk about why narrative or the stories that we tell about the world matter so much in facilitating the kinds of actions that we do in this world. I'm going to have these pictures up for a while. So. so I've been asked by scientists, especially during Idle No More's most visible activist moments back in 2013, how they could get involved in the activism of that movement, how scientists could help. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So because for those of you that don't know, I want to explain a little bit about Idle No More. It uh, is a, a movement founded by four women, three indigenous and one non-indigenous, in Saskatoon, Canada, around the new year of 2013. Those four women were responding to proposed Canadian legislation under the conservative Harper government that would lessen environmental regulation and simultaneously threaten Indigenous treaty rights. The four women called Indigenous Canadians and allies to come together to do nonviolent actions to bring attention to environmental degradation across Canada. The movement gained global attention. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the movement gained global attention. Um, and it both inspired and hooked up with indigenous environmental activism in other countries. The movement at Standing Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline, or No Dapple, also led by indigenous women and with a lot of involvement, by the way, also by a queer and two-spirit people, that movement at Standing Rock was inspired in part by Idle No More, although I'm not sure that, that people always know that. And there was a lot of movement back and forth across the U.S.-Canadian border by um, Idle No More activists, particularly a lot of women and queer folks going back and forth, kind of uh, uh, providing assistance. So to come back to scientists, we just witnessed, witnessed the March for Science on April 22nd across the U.S. and in many other cities around the world. As scientists and others protested, for example, the Trump administration's proposed cuts to scientific research and their ongoing denial of climate change. Of course, the Earth was in crisis long before Donald Trump, with science and technology fields contributing mightily to that, as well as offering hope for mitigating damages. So my feeling during that science march, and I was in New Orleans at the American Association of Physical Anthropologists hanging out with all those diverse scientists, and, and uh, one of our panelists during that uh, symposium in which people were sitting on the floor, they were streaming out the hall, coined this new hashtag science tears because there were a lot of scientists crying in that room about this. this is the first time I've been in a, in a room where there were other people trying to do science that are coming with the kind of barriers that I've come with. So I was feeling, though, while we were there and the, and the AAPA was getting, you know, everybody was downstairs making signs and all these scientists were going out into the streets. What an, what an interesting moment this was in that it's taking Donald Trump to make some scientists into activists. I don't think that should be the case. But from what I've seen in working in these fields, too many scientists have soothed their non-involvement in political struggle with the myth that science is separate from politics. <clears throat> 
even while science has long been central to nation building. And dreams of nation building are at the heart of the damage done to this planet and to indigenous peoples. Many people across the US and in Canada too lament this moment of so-called not normal crisis in a way that dreams of US redemption. To lament the Trump presidency via recourse to the dream of a better USA or some inherently democratic US project is to accept the fundamental condition of US existence, which is ongoing indigenous elimination. Ongoing indigenous genocide that is simultaneously human and other than human, and which has proceeded apace in the so-called Americas for 525 years and counting. While an explicit white supremacist inhabits the White House again, the US and Canada, and I am sure New Zealand and Australia too, celebrate many founding fathers who were of the same ilk. There's a ghost in here moving my thing around. But indigenous elimination did not cease under supposedly more enlightened or even anti-racist presidents or prime ministers. Settler colonialism as a structure must feed off indigenous dispossession. It is not its only food, but it is a required nutrient. Fundamental to dispossessing indigenous peoples of their homelands is the long-standing narrative that we are closer to nature. Indigenous studies scholar Aileen Morton Robinson points out that, quote, being perceived as living in a state of nature relegates one's existence to being an inseparable part of nature and therefore incapable of possessing it. Appropriation of land, waters, and biological resources, our very DNA has therefore been justified because of that kind of narrative. Of course, indigenous peoples recognize our intimate relations in what others call nature, as my Koyankawi friend, poet, and acorn mushmaker Linda Knoll explains, quote, I don't mind being close to nature, but I know what they mean when they say that. That's not what I mean. When she says that, she's speaking of the relations of sustenance that circulate, for example, around oak trees in what is now northern coastal California, and between the acorns of those oak trees, deer, woodpecker, and humans in that area. And she talks about the way that all of those beings together circulate that resource, leave enough for one another, the way that they, they are in relation, acorns, deer, oak trees, woodpecker, and humans. It's really quite beautiful the way she describes it. So that story leads me to the idea that for scientists and for all of the people, I think a new redemptive narrative is required. Another narrative to script the world that we can imagine, one besides always inherently eliminatory anti-indigenous nationalisms. If we are to live together in a good way in these lands as kin or as peoples in alliance with reciprocal responsibilities to one another and to our other than human relatives with whose land, water, and animal bodies we are all co-made, American dreaming, nation state dreams of exceptionalism cannot be our guiding hope. Dreaming of multicultural inclusion into states born of indigenous genocide and born of a hierarchy of life that places whites above blacks men above women, humans above animals and other non-humans, that can no longer be our fundamental guiding logic. We should be practicing in every possible moment small acts of visionary resistance and deep narrative revision that forego the relentlessly violent love for the nation state in favor of caring for our relatives, both human and other than human whose lives depend upon these lands and waters. The narrative that we are all related is a foundational ethic among my people, the Dakota, but I see such an ethic also flourishing perhaps in different words, now in various Western disciplines and languages from ecology to interspecies thinking to the new materialisms. I circulate a lot in different kinds of uh, multidisciplinary fields and I really do think that we are in a moment now where it is possible to do the hard work of translation among these various ways of knowing, both inside and outside the academy to call each other into relation with one another in ways that are critical of these heavily militarized, racist, misogynistic, and destructive empires, rather than calling for their impossible redemption. Calling non-indigenous peoples into better relations is to call them to be more accountable to indigenous lifeways, long constituted an intimate relation with these places. The idea that we are all related might inspire new ways of organizing and standing together in the face of state violence, against both humans and the planet. That is one of the things I saw unfold at Standing Rock during this past year. Despite the pain of our history as Ocheti Shakawin people, we have already 
been post-apocalyptic since at least the end of the 19th century, my people have. The people at Standing Rock called Indigenous and non-Indigenous people from around the world into relation. They called people into relation with one another and to think of their responsibilities to the water and to the land. As with Idle No More, you can call it activism, but there's a deeper logic of being in good relation that is at the heart of these movements. So I'm going to close with the, word of, the words of Harvard University's Cornell West to show both the possibility for coming into better relation, but also how pervasive across the political spectrum is the project of ongoing indigenous erasure that hinders those good relations. So Dr. West wrote in The Guardian on November 17th, post-Trump election, we must build multiracial alliances to combat poverty and xenophobia, Wall Street crimes and war crimes, global warming and police abuse, and to protect precious rights and liberties. We must be a hope, a participant, and a force for good as we face this catastrophe. Dr. West also spoke of our democracy slipping away. And in his recognition of the many diverse peoples in the U.S. and abroad done wrong by U.S. neoliberalism, not once did he reflect on indigenous peoples. Though indigenous dispossession is fundamental to providing the literal ground upon which West laments democratic loss, Cornell West, like many of his fellow Americans, erased indigenous people both in the Americas and elsewhere and their ongoing genocide as the nation's foundational condition. Still, I will stand beside Cornell West in multiracial alliance and what is more, I stand in alliance with both human and other than human relations who suffer across the planet from the violence that is the American dream. Scientists and engineers must recognize their role in that and their responsibility to resist hierarchical and extractive narratives that have scripted this world in crisis, which science has helped to make. But I also believe there's a role, as I said earlier, for science and technology to help mitigate some of those damages. I do think it is really crucial that we start telling ourselves and our children and the coming generations a different kind of story about how we can do this work together. Thank you. for questions, so um, if there are questions for Kim, uh, there are the roving microphones going around the room. I've got a question, Kim, to start off. I've <laughs> okay. got to stand near the microphone. I'm going to try not to fall off. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think what you've done here is provide, uh, through this, this presentation today, provide a, a number of case studies of how we can overcome being blind to, I guess, privilege and what it can do for, we, for you if you're in a position of privilege and not if you're not. Hmm. Do you have any generic insights into how we deal with that in science? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I did say it's a, it's a chicken and egg thing, right? So I'll. You know, it's, um, I'll, I can give you another story. I've interviewed a lot of indigenous scientists and one of the things that, that they have told me is that having a, a principal investigator who um, makes a, a place in the laboratory in which they can uh, sort of bring their cultural background in and talk about that frankly and not be expected to weed that out. So for example, uh, Navajo people or Diné have, um, there are certain animals like snakes and owls that I think are taboo and they're not supposed to be around and it's, um, they have had, when they've had, uh, I've interviewed Navajo scientists, one of whom had a Nigerian PI and another one had a South Asian PI, and they said that just having somebody who comes from a culture in which they understand these sorts of different ways of knowing and can hold all of that together without reconciling it made a big difference in terms of just making them feel comfortable that they didn't have to kind of leave part of themselves completely out of the laboratory. Um, the other thing I will say, kind of a major insight I've had is um, while because I work with geneticists, I will often hear, well, indigenous people are, you know, we can't cater to their creation stories. And what I've learned in, in hanging out with indigenous scientists is it's actually not creationism versus evolution that's the problem. That might be the problem when you're dealing with Christian creationists. But indigenous people don't tend to have proselytizing religions as traditional religions. We're not trying to make you go into our ceremonies, right? We're not coming in, kidnapping your children, starting residential schools and making you go to ceremony, okay? You're fine doing what you want to do. 
the, the problem, so it's not that. It's, we have a really nuanced understanding of the, of the ways in which science has always already been politicized because our bodies have been the objects of those kinds of political projects. So I think having an understanding that it's not science versus creationism, but it's rather understanding the sort of deep political ground within which science has grown that indigenous people understand and then coming into conversations if you're trying to set up a research project in an indigenous community in which um, you're really prepared to accept, even if you don't believe yourself, the veracity or the legitimacy of their ways of understanding the world. And you're OK to sit at a table and not have to reconcile all these different forms of knowledge, but sit at a table in which there's another form of knowledge being offered that you don't quite believe or you're not comfortable with, but you can sit there with that in the same way that you go to another country and you know you use the wrong words or you you know, I almost get hit every day when I walk in the street here because I look the wrong way or I don't know how to order coffee or, you know, I just sit there with my discomfort. And we all know how to do that as we travel around the world and into different communities. We, we know that we're making missteps, we're saying the wrong things. We need to learn to, to sit with that, that discomfort if we want to work with indigenous communities too um, and not feel that um, our way of knowing is necessarily the best way. It's a good way, and there are other ways um, to, to come to understand uh, how the world might work or the questions that should be asked. I know that's a little vague, but yeah. Okay, any other questions for Kim this morning? <laughs> I'll be brave, because uh, it's a very uh, interesting and subject. Um, my wife is uh, a U.S. citizen, and all my children are U.S. citizens. And um, in my household, um, me and the cats are not, basically. Um, what you brought up today is actually a very, it's, it's been a conversation in our household for the last 25 years, I think. And that is how um, New Zealand culture and U.S. culture slightly differs in the way, I, I think, government professional uh, people respond to the politics of the time. Now, my question for you is that from New Zealand, it looks like what's going on in the States, especially, is completely broken. And um, I wondered if you could, uh, if you had any views on that, given the amazing stuff that you've just been talking about. Because, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't look it, it, it looks pretty bleak in the States at the moment from um, the bipolarism, I guess, of, 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 of the discussion. Yeah, I, I try to keep a, a global view of this, and of course there's a, the paradox of that is my U.S. passport and the fact that I speak English so well, right, it gives me a lot of privilege to move around this world. I mean, in fact, I get more trouble when I go home with a U.S. passport than I got coming into New Zealand or I went going into Sweden earlier this year, so there's a lot of privilege in that. Um, but I say I try to keep a global view because for many people in the United States, it's already been grim for a very long time. It's never been anything but grim. I grew up on a reservation where there was 80% unemployment. If there were 80% unemployment across the United States, they, they would be, have killed each other by now. My people lived with that level of poverty since 1862. Um, so. I try to keep in mind these sort of undulations, right, and the fact that even while the U.S. may have ended its Indian Wars in 1890 and slavery may have ended in the 1860s, the U.S. has moved its violence and its, its, its colonial violence around the world, right? And so when that, I had already moved to Canada when the, when the election happened last year and I was noticing that all of the, my social media feeds coming out of the U.S., even for my progressive friends, right, people who I think should know better, who are not just myop, myopic and have a view that's only about the U.S., 90% of their analyses, if not more, of the election were only about what was going to happen domestically if Trump got elected. There was very little conversation about what the U.S. has already been doing globally. And I was really disheartened by that because it's like, so as, as long as they don't come for you, it's okay. It's okay that this nation is built on that kind of violence and genocide. And, and just know, so I'm forgetting your question again. So this, this is... <laughs> 
this is the this is the, the the view I tried to have through all of that. And again, I recognize that I'm able to have that view in part because I have traveled globally, right? And I work on indigenous issues globally. And of course, it's it's harder for people. Before 9/11, the statistic I heard was that 80% of Americans didn't have passports. There's still a whole lot of people who haven't been anywhere outside of those boundaries, and it's very hard for them to see. Um, anything beyond that sort of linear progressive narrative of, of American exceptionalism. Um, so I, I've, in a sense, I don't know that I can answer what most Americans are thinking because be, I've been dismayed with, their, with what they're thinking, but I don't, I'm not sure I've answered your question. The, the fundamentally broken thing, from my people's point of view, as I said, we've been living post-apocalyptically since 1862. I mean, has it been working? You know, there's that, and then there's the other side of that, excuse me, which is for those very, very few of us who are privileged like me, sure, I can take the one side of my personality and say, yes, it's been working, and on the other side, you know, we've been, we've been sustaining in this kind of um, post-apocalyptic world as indigenous people for a long time. So again, for me, keeping that global view really helps me think about all of us being in relation together instead of um, this, I really don't like that notion of linear progressive time because I think that, that again, uh, feeds back into that, that understanding of, of hierarchies, of exceptionalism, and I think it con counteracts us actually doing the relational work on the ground that we need to do to take care of one another. Um, and so that's why, anyway, I'm getting off on a... <laughs> I'm getting off on a... <laughs> this is why I script my talks, because I tell lots of stories. <laughs> so thank you for your question, though. Thank you very much for your contribution, thought-provoking and guilt-inducing, I might say. Uh, it's good for us to hear it. I'm wondering, given the state of things and the content of your talk, has social media, are social media making any difference at all? Are they improving things? Are they making it worse? Or are they not doing anything at all? Mm -hmm. It's the most recent phenomenon we're all grappling with, including people in this room trying to get onto the site. Thank you. Um, well, I'm always on social media, so I'm, you know, you're, I'm somebody who's invested in it. <laughs> um, for me, as an indigenous thinker, um, I was really dubious of the notion of indigeneity back in the early 90s when it cropped up in my world, and I thought, no, I'm Dakota, and after that, I'm a Native American. But I've actually really, since traveling internationally and, and seeing the generative power of indigeneity, and we, and that, I'm coming back to social media, um, we learn a lot of lessons, shared lessons of decolonization. Um, we learn about how similar these colonial projects were around the world. It has been very enlightening uh, for me as an indigenous person to have that global network. And, and even for those people back home who ha don't have a passport and have never been out of the US, indigenous people are on social media a lot. And this is really, an, it, it, this helped with some of the environmental uh, activism and organizing, right? So I'd say it's, it's great for us. I mean, they, you go to powwows in the US, they have this t-shirt, Facebook Indian FBI that they sell. Like we're always on social media. Um, you know, I'm sure there are, there are downsides to it as well, right? Because, uh, You've got to be careful about, uh, you know, the facts on the ground when you're looking at that. But, um, you know, again, I, I feel like it's been as much of a benefit as it's been um, a disadvantage, as with most technologies, right? They all have their ups and downsides. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank I you. think we'll move on. So please um, join me again in thanking Kim very Thank much. Thank you. Tena kui te ronga tira e te marae kura, mo e nei kore roko a fari kia mo i te aruaru o te minenga. Kim, uh, thank you very much for travelling such a long way uh, to deliver, I think, quite a hard-hitting and very revealing uh, discussion on um, decolonising science, which is something I think that this challenge is very aware of as we move into dealing with these wicked issues that, that, that this country is facing around our biological heritage, and I think. Um, the notion of decolonising science is a conversation that we're having right at this moment, and so uh, it's not an easy one, but I think it's one that does need to be had um, if we are to make some real progress. But uh, again, I just acknowledge your rivers, your, your mountains, and your people, um, and a, a small token of our appreciation Thank for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.